So let's start analyzing this problem. So of course, uh, what's the major force that plays here, here is the force of gravity. So we will use Sir Isaac Newton's general, uh, the universal law of attraction, the universal law of gravity. So this is, uh, in this form, it's idealization for two point particles with masses capital M and small m. The attraction between them is inverse proportional to the square of the distance between them and is proportional to the product of their masses and there is some constant of proportionality. Now, why is this law called the universal law of gravity? Well, there is this legend about Sir Isaac Newton and an apple falling on his head, and at this moment he realizes that there is a force that attracts the apple. In fact, what Newton realized at that moment is much more than that, because uh, Newton was trying to, uh, as other scientists of, of his time, wanted to understand the motion of the planets and, and of the stars that they were observing, and of course of the moon, and the sun and uh, the motion of the earth around the sun etc and so uh, at those uh, times there was still a distinction between earthly forces and celestial forces uh, at that time they were considered to have different nature but in fact what Newton realized is that the same force that made the apple fall to the ground is the same force that holds the moon in its orbit around the earth and so this is the realization and unification of forces that this force is for all of universe it's universal it's the same physics for the entire universe that's the uh that's the revolution in thinking to due to sir isaac newton the same physics everywhere in the entire universe and what happens in space and on earth is uh the same the same forces the same physics so it is it is super important and every time that there is a unification of forces in physics, there is a big revolution and big uh, understanding that is uh, following this. For example, uh, in the electromagnetic theory, at first the electric forces and magnetic forces were considered to be uh, of different nature, but then with Einstein's special theory of relativity, uh, it was actually understood that those are the same phenomenon, the electric field and the magnetic field, just viewed from different uh, systems. So it's it's the same thing, it, and this unification, of course, brought lots of revolutions. So even this small, subtle subject is, and, and simple subject, you see how many subtleties are, are there. And so now if we look at this uh, idealized uh, idealized uh, law of attraction here, then what happens when we have a massive object like the Earth, something big, and another object here, this is mass M and this is M. So in general, it's taught, I think, in high schools that in general, to analyze the attraction between them, then we need to partition those into chunks, and then for each small chunk to consider the attraction between uh, this small chunk here, and then to sum, in general, over all those interactions, right? And then perform this complicated volume integral for this chunk, and then for every chunk here, and then to sum up all those forces, right? It's a complicated integral. But in fact, what can be shown is that when treating the motion of this body, uh, mostly we're interested only uh, it's enough to understand the motion of its center of mass and we can consider as though this body this, this the idealization of course when we're ignoring rotation because when we have rotation it's more complicated but, but for the simple case of motion say without rotation it's enough to understand only the motion of the center of mass and it can be considered as all the mass of the object is just centered here at the center of mass and what is happening with the earth then at least for uh, for spheres or round objects, it, it uh, Newton tried to prove that for the sphere, of course, for the observer that is observing from outside and feels the gravitational uh, force of sphere with, uh, say, uniform mass distribution, for him it will be the same as though there was this imaginary particle with all point particle, with all the mass of the Earth's center at the center, and then uh, the field that would be produced by this particle at the center, which will have the same, the gravitational field, would, which will have the same mass, right? It will be the same, uh, so the observer that feels the first cannot distinguish between the case of a point particle having all the mass centered uh, at this point, or uh, feeling the uh, gravitational field of this uniform sphere. Actually, it was proved by Gauss with Gauss law, uh, for electrostatic uh, for electric charges, but since the uh, since the equations and, and the law 
uh, of attraction is of the same shape, inverse proportional to the square, actually it turns out uh, that it's valid even for the gravitational field. Newton eventually were able to prove it, but Gauss then demonstrated it even easily here. So, of course, we're now to the idealization that all the mass of the Earth is at the center of the single point. And so now what we have here is that we have the following situation. We have this Earth, right? And we have this object. And now let's see uh, where this uh, where this approximation is valid and how is it valid. So if this small r, right, this is r, this is the distance, it's combined of this uh, radius of the Earth and this, uh, say, d, this distance from the face of the Earth, right? And then we've explained that actually the first of gravity that acts on, on this mass m, we will consider as though it's all acting on the center of mass, and this is the Earth here, and we consider as though all the mass of the Earth is centered at, at this point, then the force of gravity, Fg, will be g m, the mass of the Earth, uh, times m, divided essentially by r radius of the Earth plus d here, all of its square. Now, the radius of the Earth is uh, roughly, it's an average, right? Because why is it an average radius? Because the Earth is not a uh, perfect sphere, it's more like an ellipsoid, of course it's an exaggeration, but it's not uh, It's not this ideal sphere. And so the average radius is 6371 kilometers, right? Or it's on the scale, so it's roughly uh, 6371, uh, right? 6,371,000 meters, right? And when we're dealing on the Earth, of course, typical heights, when even when we're talking about 100 meters, which is, of course, negligible compared to this side, this is a skyscraper, right? So for projectile motions or those fountains, of course, this is a few meters. And so, of course, this approximation where Re uh, plus Rd is roughly the radius of the Earth, right, due to variations, that's, that's the approximation that is going to be describing this, this uh, motion here. Of course, when uh, a rocket is launched into orbit, of course, we need to use this general, uh, more complicated formula. But then we'll say that this is roughly g m m divided by radius of the Earth squared. Okay. And so now, what about the constant acceleration that we want to derive here as part of the problem setup? Well, in this case, what happens is that if we have that the force of gravity that is acting on the object is uh, g m m divided by the radius of the Earth, so this is a fixed and, and a constant one uh, quantity here, then using Newton's second law of motion, if we want, if this is the only force that is acting, and we want to derive the, its acceleration, that f equals m a, force equals mass times acceleration, and so we would say f equals m a. And then what we would do typically in high school is to, we would reduce the m from here and we would reduce from uh, the m from here. And we actually say that this acceleration is the free fall constant acceleration on the earth. And we'll call it uh, lowercase g. This is g m uh, divided by the radius of the earth squared. Okay, that's, that's the value. And we know that this is roughly 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, this is all known, but I want to address a small subtlety here. So, in fact, what is mass, uh, this mass and this mass? So, in fact, this law of Newton can, can serve almost as a definition of mass, because it's not that easy to define mass. So, this is actually a definition of the inertial mass. This is some quantity of material that when we know the force, or it could... Actually, there is a nice discussion of this in the Feynman lectures on physics, right? If we know some force, Right. Uh, so for example, we can define uh, um, the measure of force by the extension of a spring, the Hooke's hook law, for example. Then uh, the force that is needed to give a uh, certain acceleration to a body is a measure of its mass. Right. This is the inertial mass. And the in the universal law of attraction, the mass is something that measures how strongly two bodies are attracted when there is a known distance between them. And so those masses are called gravitational mass. So this is m gravitational and this is m gravitational. So in fact, this equation should have been written otherwise as the inertial mass and the gravitational mass. And so why are we allowed to reduce them and consider them as equal? And so experiments actually verified that the inertial mass and the gravitational mass are uh, equal up to a degree of 10 to the minus of 12, there were experiments. 
And then Einstein finally said that in his principle of equivalence and general relativity, that this is not coincidence, and in fact, they are absolutely equal. And the reason for this is that we cannot distinguish between gravity and acceleration, and those are absolutely equivalent. And therefore, uh, gravitational mass and inertial mass are absolutely equal, and therefore, this is justified, and we're allowed to do this. And now we know that what, what this G means. So this is the free fall acceleration, and it's roughly constant in the vicinity of the Earth. Of course, if we're talking about distances which are less than 100 meters, then of course it's negligible to this distance of uh, of a couple of roughly 6 million and 400,000 roughly meters, right? So of course those 100 meters are negligible, and we can consider this field of gravity as roughly constant. Moreover, the approximation, so this field is radial, right? But since the radius of the Earth is so big, right? I mean, it's it's relative, right? But of course, relatively to us. Then this curvature here is barely felt. And so to an observer here, this this curve with very lar large, um, right? Basically, the straight line can be considered as a curve with as a circle with infinite radius of curvature. And so in, in this vicinity, right, if we're in, in our own, say, apartment, and we see the floor, then basically, we will not see the change in in the direction of g so it's uh g is this constant so we fix this axis y axis and then what we have with this g is that it's constant constantly pointing only along the y axis it, and it doesn't deviate like in here because it's slightly changing its direction but this this is the validity of our assumption so g is therefore constant and it's pointing in in the y direction when we choose it in this way right this would be our local y-axis. This is y, and this is x here. We're on the face of the Earth here. And so here, g roughly is constant pointing along the y direction. So typically, we would write that g as a vector. We can write this as this minus this scalar g uh, in the direction of y hat. So it's minus uh, 9.8 meter seconds squared of the direction of this y hat. Yeah. OK. So now this is the setup of the problem, and we can start and analyze the problem, finally, and derive the equations.